Hey everyone, we're back for another episode of Ask a GN. As always, leave your questions in the comments below if you want them to be addressed next video, if we can get to them, hopefully. And one quick request here, if anyone's got not GPU questions, that would be great, because we're doing all video card content and I'm going a little crazy. So if you have a not video card question, please post it below. Cooling, cases, CPUs, I don't care, anything. Uh, so first of all, before we get into the content, this video, this episode is brought to you by MSI and their GTX 1060 Gaming X video card, which comes with the twin Frozer cooler. So first question uh, is from, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, but Nite Haim, uh, who says, I have a 1080 and recently discovered fast sync. I have a 60 Hertz ultra wide and my FPS is usually between 60 to 80 in games. I play, uh, sh should I turn it on or wait, what should I turn? Fast sync on. Okay. Should I turn fast sync on? Does G sync, what does G sync solve that fast sync doesn't? And why should anyone buy G sync if there is V sync without stuttering or latency? So there's three solutions here we're talking about. I'm, I'm not going to address free sync here just because a three is, is frankly enough to go over. We'll maybe talk about free sync if someone posts a question, but uh, specifically looking at V sync, G sync, and fast sync. VSync's been around forever. G-Sync is the physical module that's placed on your monitor. And then FastSync is the new solution that's in NVIDIA drivers, which began shipping with the GTX 1080 Pascal cards. I think we talked about it super briefly in a previous article or video, but I did not go into depth, so we can, we can certainly talk about that. First of all, VSync is, uh, we have talked about this in previous videos. If you look up what is G-Sync, we talk about it, but very briefly, VSync sort of uh, chokes the game engine. So if you're, say your refresh rate 60 hertz, VSync will make it so that if, if your frame rate output is above 60 FPS, it'll drag it down to 60, and then every X milliseconds, uh, 16 milliseconds with a 60 hertz display, every 16 milliseconds there will be a frame that goes to the display, so you have no tearing. And tearing is when, as a frame is drawn vertically, because it refreshes vertically, as a frame is drawn, uh, another frame comes in the pipe and starts drawing as well. So you get a tear, which is basically like if you've ever seen sort of a, a character or a tree or some vertical object is the best example where you'll see it kind of, if, if it's like this normally and then the next half the frame gets drawn, you'll see them like that. So the tree is now sort of torn, i.e. or e, in essence tearing. So, so that's what tearing is and VSync solves that by choking back the frame rate to match exactly the monitor, the refresh rate, but you can potentially introduce stuttering with VSync on. So there's two different terms here, tearing and stuttering. They're not the same thing. Tearing is what I just described, where the visual, the image itself looks torn because multiple frames are coming in, potentially hitting the screen at the same time. These are called runts when you have sort of short pieces of frames or fragments. So these runts come in, you get tearing, the alternative is when you have VSync on, you get stuttering. Stuttering is if your frame rate falls below the target, 60 hertz in this kind of example. You fall below the 60 hertz target, and now your frame rate output uh, is such that if you sort of miss that 16 millisecond timer, because 60 hertz, so 16 milliseconds for each frame, you miss that timer, then uh, it will redraw the previous frame. So that's a stutter. That's when basically there's missing data. And so this is why a lot of gamers, especially in competitive fields, prefer no VSync to VSync because they'd sort of rather have uh, the torn frames and have all the information and then just kind of mentally calculate the difference. It's not really, it's second nature to all of us at this point, as opposed to missing data. So that's VSync. G-Sync solves that, uh, which we explain in our What is G-Sync video. To answer this question, FastSync is the new one. So uh, FastSync decouples the render pipeline and the display hardware, and so the game engine acts as if VSync is off. So it acts like it's off. That means it's pushing as many frames as it possibly can as they're created, rather than limiting like VSync would do, where it, it back pressures. And this eliminates that back pressure with FastSync, and it lowers latency, but tearing is still removed. So how does that happen? Because now you've got no VSync, and you have no G-Sync, but there's no tearing either. And that's done because FastSync will choose frames to send to the display based on what it thinks will look best. And so the entire frame is saved and displayed 
rather than frame fragments and runs like I explained previously. So it just it picks an entire frame and outputs it, and that's what fast sync is. So hopefully that answers that question. The next question, John Jacobson asks, will buying a card like the Strix guarantee you get a higher bin to GPU uh, than what you would in a cheaper card? Is it the cooler that makes the price difference? Generally, the cooler is what makes the price difference and pre-overclocks and sometimes other software features and things like that, or warranties. Uh, but generally, the cooler is what makes a difference. And then in terms of binning, uh, there's no guarantee from it. There, there are certain brands and models of those brands that will be binned. The Canon pen cards are a good, good example of something that's really expensive, but they do bin out the better chips. So that's one sort of model where you do get binning. Uh, some of the high-end gigabyte cards are, are binned. And most of the brands and AIB partners do have a high-end model, and they will do some binning. You need to look and see if they advertise that. But just being Strix doesn't necessarily mean it's binned. Just being uh, SSC doesn't necessarily mean it's binned. All it means is that they've pre-overclocked it to whatever value, and there's a cooler on it. So unless they're explicitly saying with whatever Strix you're looking at that it's binned, the answer is probably no. Uh, but it, it may still be pre-overclocked anyway, because pre-overclocking normally is not that extreme from the factory. Oops, it can be generally pulled off on the average chip for that GPU. Next question is from Tuchalu, Tuchalu who says, uh, question, are Vishera chips still worth getting? Should I wait for Zen? I would say, just like very definitively, don't buy FX chips right now. It doesn't make sense. The platform is ancient. It's a 2011 platform, I think, AM3+. Plus. I think that's 2011. AM3 is 2009, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so that's old. That's pre-USB 3. The USB 3 on these platforms is controlled by a separate controller that's been added to the board. It's not natively supported by the chipset. Same is through, true for PCIe Gen 3. And uh, there's some stability issues on some of these boards. Sure, some of them work fine. I'm sure many of you will comment and say how perfectly yours runs. But if you're building a new system today, I would really not recommend FX because it's, it's just old at this point. You either buy a current gen Intel or last gen Intel is even fine. That makes sense or an FM2 plus CPU if you're kind of lower end and you want to buy like uh, an X4, 880K is a good chip, or 860 or 845, they're all good chips for their price range. Those are fine. I would not buy FX. Uh, I would wait for either Zen or buy something if you need it now in one of those lines I just mentioned, X4 or, uh, or the Intel lineups, depending on your price range. Uh, but FX definitely is, it's just, it's, I mean, it just feels kind of weird at this point to buy something that's got an architecture that old when there's one months away, potentially, uh, if, the, if the schedule is stuck to. And it's also got some stability issues depending on which chip you buy, the 9000 series. And in my experience, has not been a great performer with everyday computing if you get a board that's, and the boards are a problem, if you get a board that uh, has VRM issues or whatever. So I'd avoid it. It's, it's too, too much hassle right now for an aged product uh, when there's better stuff out there for basically the same price. Uh, and that's the biggest thing. Last question is, or well, yeah, last question before I have an endurance test update is from uh, Gert Tarkter, who says, uh, does the, this is actually a good question. Does the quality of the PSU affect max overclocking potential instability? A few months ago, I swapped out a secondhand bronze that I think was tier three with a nicer gold PSU and was able to hit a higher stable CPU GPU overclock than when using the previous power supply? The answer is yes. So that's not a fluke that you saw that difference. Power supplies affect a lot of things, but the main thing with overclocking is voltage delivery. So uh, a really cheap power supply, there's a few different issues that can possibly pop up, but the one we'll focus on is V droop, voltage droop. So any voltage throughput, uh, it's not going to be a flat line voltage throughput. It's always a little bit spiky, but reducing that spikiness is important, and the good power supplies will do this. And uh, if you've got a PSU that has more V droop, what will happen is your clock rate will suddenly take a hit if it gets a voltage that it's not expecting or demanding. And that's where you see 
a diminished stability in terms of your potential maximum overclock. So a higher end power supply, there are diminishing returns of course, but a higher end power supply for the average overclock would theoretically allow you to get a higher OC than something like a $30 Diablo Tech PSU. Uh, and so the short answer is yes, V-droop is a big factor. And then overcurrent protection, things like that are also big factors. If you have a, if you get really serious about overclocking, overcurrent protection will actually genuinely protect your components, the board, the CPU, whatever, if something's, uh, so something's screwy in there, especially if you're doing volt mods or hard mods. But that's the short answer to that one. The last thing I wanted to bring up is the endurance test. So uh, we started that RX 480 endurance test not long ago, and uh, I have run the test. It's, actually, it's an interesting problem because we haven't collected this much data for something ever. So I've got uh, dozens of files that are six hours in, in capture length, and that is uh, hundreds of thousands of cells in a spreadsheet. So I'm trying to figure out how to process it without having issues. Google Sheets can't do it. Uh, I have local software now that's doing it, like actual software, not on the internet. And that's working okay. Now I need to figure out how to display the data. The, I, I haven't crunched it all yet, but the short sort of preview is we didn't really see any issues. The motherboard's fine, it still works. So the RX 480 on 16.6.2 with the overdraw through the PCIe bus, as it appears right now, before crunching the data, does not appear to have hurt the motherboard in a substantial fashion from the week or so burn-in that was run. But uh, that's, not, that's not a definitive statement. It's just kind of a preview. I think you would need a, an even cheaper motherboard or something out of spec, AM2 maybe, uh, for something super cheap that doesn't make any sense would have issues. But we're not seeing issues on this one. So that's a very quick update. Uh, we'll get a video online as soon as I can figure out the presentation of data and stuff like that. But that's all for this time. As always, Patreon link will post a real video if you want to help us out directly. Link in the description below for the channel, Twitter, all that stuff. Subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.